a welcome to those of you who are in the room this morning and those of you who are watching on uh, channel uh, 81 in the afternoon or watching by YouTube at some other time. Grateful for God's goodness and mercy to us and our ongoing study of the book of Psalms. This has been very enjoyable for, uh, for me. A number of years ago, uh, several years ago now, because I was still working at the time, I sketched out a seven-year study plan for myself. I took seven books of the scriptures and said, okay, these are kind of the high marks of scripture. So Genesis, Psalms, Isaiah, and the Old Testament. Uh, John, um, Romans, Hebrews, Revelation, in the New Testament. And I'll spend one year on each book. And in addition to my other studies for whatever I was doing, you know, I will spend this, this time. Well, uh, I got through that. It took me nine years, I think, to get through it with all of the interruptions and whatnot. So after I retired, uh, two or three years back, I thought, why don't I try this again? Right? So last year was Genesis. This year is Psalms. It was part of the reason I decided to do Psalms for our study. I could you know, overlap and wouldn't have to be doing three studies. I could just do two. Right? So anyway, uh, the wonder of this is the way in which God works in us, works his word in. So then thank you for that prayer that God will work himself in us, not just in our minds through the word, you know, but in our hearts, in our spirits, making this real. The Kellers, uh, uh, Tim Keller, the Presbyterian pastor, who uh, died recently, uh, and his wife Kathy, a number of years ago, did a book on uh, the uh, uh, devotional book on the Psalms. So they divided the Psalms into 365 days. <laughs> and so at the end of it, you've read through the entire Psalm. Uh, but one of the things that they emphasized was the way in which God works in our heart. <coughs> we see the Word in Scripture, and we see the Word in our spirit on the cross resurrected for us and they emphasize that twofold nature of our relationship to God through scripture and through the work of the Holy Spirit in us so thank you Dennis for making that point in prayer and uh, this allows us then to uh, move on to pick up we're doing uh, four Psalms uh, this morning one is a kind of a preface if you will to the other three and the other three uh, the first one is, is Psalm 59, and then 60, 61, and 62 seem to me to, to form a kind of a triad. And we'll talk more about that as we move along. But there are background uh, scriptures that help us grasp some of the issues here. Uh, not all of them, but some of them. Because one of the things that David is doing, these are all attributed to David. And one of the things that he's doing is he will take a particular incident in his life and connect it to other incidences later on. So that these four psalms appear to cover a period somewhere between 35 and 42 years. I didn't try to do this in detail. I just used the word 40 as a round number. Right? So we've got a length of time that beginning before he was even king. He'd been anointed by Samuel, but he had not been established as king yet. He had married Saul's daughter, Michael, and then we go all the way out somewhere toward the end of his life. While he's still a warrior, while he's still leading the armies of Israel, which he did right up until about the last five or so years of his life, when his soldiers decided, no, you're too risky. and We can't, we can't have the possibility that you'd be killed and the nation would be without you. So they made him stop going out with the troops. Right? And we see that in Second Samuel, I guess it is where we see that passage. And they tell him, no, you can't go anymore. And he, he listens to them. He, he takes the counsel. Can you imagine what humility that took for the king of Israel, the general of the armies, who since he was 17 years old has been leading the armies to step down and honor the suggestion of his troops. I mean, that's incredible, the kind of humility it takes to do that and to accept that recognition and step down. Uh, but he did so. Anyway, the Psalms, these four Psalms, cover apparently much of this time period. And so we have background specifically for the, the Michael thing, when she, remember, covers up the, the idol 
and puts a wig on it and, and covers it up and uh, lets him down by a rope to get away from her dad. And uh, isn't that a wonderful thing? Your father-in-law is out to get you. <laughs> Anybody have that experience? I'm grateful I did not. <laughs> anyway, we have this background, this specific background in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and the verses that are there. And then the other events that are alluded to, either in the intros to the individual psalms, the prefaces to the individual psalms, or inside of them, uh, 2 Samuel 8 and 10, and 1 Chronicles 18 and 19 uh, have a relationship uh, to them. So Psalm 59, the first one we have on our list, is the one that picks up the, the earliest incident, but then connects it to other incidents as well. And we'll see how this works. And so what I want to see here, as we move through these, and it occurred to me as I was studying them and looking carefully at them, as he moves through time, he has similar kinds of experiences in that people are out to get him. He's the king, after all. And eventually one of his own sons is out to get him. The surrounding kings and the neighboring nations are out to get him at various times. And so he goes through similar kinds of experiences at different stages in his life. And yet he comes back to the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And how does he know it? He knows it through every trial. And I thought, this is really something about us. We sometimes think, I've often thought, every 10 years it gets rerun. <laughs> it's, it's like... You, do, you go deeper or you go higher or you go wider or something or other, but it's, it's there and it happens. And here's the Psalms that help us grasp this feature of our life so that we know today, we know God is more faithful than we did when we first became a Christian. Don't we? I mean, I can look my kids straight in the face and tell them God never fails. We may fail him. We may not understand what he's doing. But he never fails. Amen. Amen. And the more we live with him, the more we understand that. It gets deeper and deeper. Right? It strengthens us. It enriches us. It enriches our testimony and our faithfulness. Right? All the kinds of things. And I thought, these psalms are really for us. Right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit did this for us. And we are grateful uh, for it. So let's go to Psalm 59. That's where I want to uh, pick up. And you see, you can see how I've sketched out the outline. Uh, Psalm 59 is standing alone with Roman numeral 1. And then the triad, as I call them, 60, 61, and 62, I put in Roman numeral 2 and simply extended the outline downward through uh, the capital letters. And we can see uh, the way that it works. Now, I can't, uh, obviously, in the time period that we have, we couldn't go, in fact, probably any one of these psalms we could spend an entire class period on, an entire uh, 45 to 50 minutes on. <coughs> but in order to follow the themes through, I had to focus on certain kinds of things. So we won't take time to read all of the psalms all the way through. Uh, and some of you may have, when you got the outline yesterday, some of you may have read through uh, them all. Uh, but and I did apologize tonight for sending the uh, missionary prayer list out late. <laughs> it occurred to me after I hit send, <laughs> no, you weren't ready to send yet. So I hope you got that. And thank you for your continuing prayers for the missionaries. We have people who love getting that uh, prayer sheet, even though they aren't able to be here. And so from one of those uh, couples, I got a, a note back, an email note back. Thank you. Received. And I wrote them back and said, thank you for praying. And I think they, it's been maybe three or four years since they've been able to be here for uh, the class. Uh, but they're continuing to use that prayer list. So what do you have in Psalm 59? One of the things that David does when he begins crying out to God to deliver him was to defend his own innocence. The things that are happening, he says, aren't the consequence of something that I have done. So he says... They behold, I'm looking at verse 3 now. Uh, they lie in wait for me, they're bloodthirsty men. And he's talking now about the people that Saul has sent to kill him. Okay. For no transgression, I'm in the middle of verse 3 now.
for no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord. And then the first part of four. And no fault of mine. And so he declares his innocence. There's nothing that can be laid to my charge. And you, evil men who are following Saul, notice he doesn't accuse Saul at this point. He just says evil men. Now to get me. But it's not because I've done something evil. So there's an injustice going on here that he can cry out to God for. Declaring his own innocence. But at the same time, he recognizes his powerlessness to defend himself. And he is. He's in a position. Can you imagine the great honor of your wife letting you escape by holding a rope while you climb down the rope and run away? <laughs> I mean, this, this is not going out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> and so it is. He recognizes his own powerlessness, his inability to defend himself. So the last part of verse 4 there, it's no fault of mine, but they run and make ready, awake, and come and meet me and see, Lord. While he's running away, they're coming after him. He doesn't know when they will be on him again, but there he is. There's this sense of powerlessness which he comes back to in the psalm, in Psalm 59, and appears also now to expand the psalm because he will talk about the nations in verse 5. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Now, remembering what it was like as a, as a kid, David at the time he married Michael probably was less than 20, 19 or 20 years old. So he's a kid, right? Running from the most powerful man in Israel. And at the now, as king, years later, there's little Israel. He's the king. But look at the powerhouses around him. Look at those other nations and the power that they have. So there's, in both cases, a sense of powerlessness. You ever done that in your own life? Something happens in your life and you think back of an experience similar to it. And you may have remembered God's faithfulness or you may have remembered your own weaknesses or whatever it happened to be. So David is aware of this, and he recognizes his own powerlessness. He talks about it again in verses 6 and 7. He says, each evening they come back. Now he's talking about these people who are seeking him. And he'll apply it also to the nations. They come back howling like dogs and prowling around the city. And there they are, bellowing with their mouths and swords in their lips. And who, they think, will hear us? In other words, God isn't going to hear us. No one in authority is going to hear us or bring us to account for it. And so his sense of being powerless to defend himself against them. He'll say it again in verse 11. But now, notice in the middle of this, he says, all the nations, hold them in derision. We'll come back to this passage in a minute. In a minute. So he is later on expanding this, what happens to him as a boy, right? Now he's expanding it, stretching it out, and feels in the, in the midst of them a powerlessness. But watch what he says in verse 11. This is an incredible passage. Kill them not. If they're my enemies, I think, you know, I, <laughs> Lord, just deal with them, okay? <laughs> Kill them not, lest my people, his subjects, forget. And in their forgetting, they will not follow my leadership. But if they see what you have done and accomplished and are sustaining, then they will follow my leadership. And so he can say to them, make them totter. The footnote there in the uh, English Standard Version and maybe in some of the others says, make them wander. One commentary, commentary I read said, that's really a better word. It's because tottering means kind of stumbling around, right? But he meant to make them wander. Make them aimless, without anchors, without places to go, without people to protect them. Make them wanderers and send them out, away right, from them. And then he calls out to, O oh Lord, our shield. We'll come back to this verse also. So once more he says, he repeats this, each evening they come back, verse 14, howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander, now he uses the word, they wander about for food and growl if they don't get their fill. 
like animals. These people, these nations are like animals, like dogs, which were contemptuous animals, by the way, for the Israelites. And there they are. This is what these people are like. And yet in the face of that, he feels powerless, though he can recognize that God is his shield. So if you feel powerless, what do you start doing? Looking for help, <laughs> right? When we're powerless, we start looking for help. And it depends on how we feel powerless, right? If we feel powerless about our bodies, we start looking for a doctor. We can understand what's wrong with us and, and show us what to do. Most of us will pray first, even before we call a doctor. Most of us will pray first. We'll seek the Lord's help. And so this is what the psalmist does. This is what David does. He begins confessing God's goodness and then calling on him for help. So look at verse 5. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. You, God, you're the God of Israel. Okay? Not Saul and not me, now that I'm king. Put the two things in there. Not my father-in-law who's chasing me early on and not me now who is king. You, Lord, you are the one who is the king. And so he can cry out uh, to him. And, and in the latter part of verse 5, rouse, your, rouse yourself and punish all the nations. In fact, much of the rest of Psalm 60, 61 and 62 focuses on God punishing the nations around him, those who attack them in various ways. But here he is putting it together. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil as Saul had done to him. You see how he interweaves these kinds of things in, in various parts? But drop down now to verse 8, eight, uh, and, uh, 8, 9, 10, and 11 that we've mentioned already. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. Where have we heard that before? Psalm 2. You have established your king on Zion. And the nations scoff and mock and they yell, let's get rid of them. We don't want them over us. And what happens? You, Father, laugh at them and you hold them in derision. And so it is here. You laugh at them and you hold all the nations in derision. Oh, my strength, I will watch for you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress. My God, in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look and triumph on my enemies. Hasn't happened yet. He will, though, let me look. And so the encouragement for us, as it was for him, confess God's goodness. Confess his goodness. Look back on our lives and confess his goodness. Right? And the awareness of how he takes care of that. In Dave Reaver's sermon the other day at Central Assembly, he was talking about those points when you know that you're so close to physical death by violence of some kind or another that the hair you know, on the back of your neck sticks up and you just tingle all over. Okay? Uh, had that happened one night? As far as I can tell, an angel intervened. I see no reason why I should be standing here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there it was. The Lord's goodness and, and kindness. I, re I really think what happened is that the angel put his hand between my car and the car in front of me. It's the only explanation I have. I couldn't miss that car. It was right on target. <laughs> I mean, but the Lord's goodness, the Lord's mercy. Uh, and so he has confessing God's goodness. And then he can call on him for help. And repeating the verse then of 11 that we read. But notice what he says. O Lord, our shield. You're the one who is good. You're the king of Israel, and you're the shield of Israel. He's talking here about that great body shield that stands on the ground, and you can hide behind it. Right? And it covers you and protects you. And so it is. Be our shield, Lord. You are our shield. Not only for me as an individual, but for the whole nation. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That a leader of a nation can say, you, God, are the king of our nation. You, God, are the shield of our nation. It's not because we have more bombs in the silos. Right? It's not because our B-52s and our B-2s and all the others are bigger and better than yours. Right? 
It's not because Kim Jong-un, if you pull the trigger, you won't last until it goes off. You'll be gone before they get off the ground. It's not because of all of that. It's because, God, you are our shield. All that our leaders would know, God is our shield. But it means we have to be righteous. We have to be righteous. We have to walk in righteousness. It doesn't mean that everything will go hunky-dory. But it means that we have to, to do that. So he confesses and calls on God for help. And then he praises God for his power. At the end of verse 13. Do, don't, you know, they're cursing lies and so forth. Consume them till they are no more. That they may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth. Can you believe that? Wherever Jacob is and wherever his people are, David says, God rules over them. He takes care of them. An incredible promise that he makes to the children of Abraham. And so we better be cooperating. <laughs> we better be cooperating with God about this, right? And so it is that he goes on then. He praises God's power in 16 and 17. I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. My wife wakes up singing out loud sometimes. Right? She has a good voice. I don't. I don't sing out loud much. Right? Unless there are lots of people singing, I can sing. Nobody can hear me. <laughs> anyway, in the morning, for you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. You have been... That for me. But watch what he does in the next verse. Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. You are in the present. You have been and in the present. And so I'm going to keep on singing to you and making this commitment to you. And so we see him now facing his own powerlessness, powerlessness but the power of God, praising God for that and committing himself to that. And so my title here, Confessing God's Goodness, Part 2. So we see the continuation of these themes in the Psalms of David between 51 and running out through 72. <coughs> Though we won't do all of those other Psalms. Some of them will, will leave, but uh, going on here. So what do we have in this triad then of Psalm 60, 61, and 62? The backdrop for this uh, psalm, some of the, uh, the war of the nations, can best be seen in those two passages in uh, 2 Samuel and in 1 Chronicles. You can read about them. So they're kind of scattered through there. They, it's not a block of verses as the one about uh, Michael helping him escape, but they're scattered through those four chapters, two in 2 Samuel, two in uh, 1 Chronicles. So, so what do you have? First of all, there's a recognition that we have sinned. As a nation, we have sinned. And as a consequence, you have not protected us in the way that we would like for us. Oh God, you have rejected us. You've broken our defenses. You have been angry for our sinfulness. So restore us. The appeal to God, the one who forgives, the one who cleanses. You made the land to quake. You've torn it open. Repair its breaches for it totters. In this sense, totters is the right word. It's about to fall, like a wall or like a building, about to collapse. And then, you know, the repair work is long and hard and difficult. You've made your people see hard things. You've given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. You've set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to you from the bow, from destruction, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. And so we have this recognition that there is sin, but they can appeal to God for help. Drop down to verse 11 where there's a further appeal. Oh, grant us help against the foe. These two nations that he mentions in the, in the uh, preface here, uh, they're Aramaic nations and two different groups of them. Right? And they had gathered around them a very powerful set of forces from other nations that they had rented soldiers from mercenary troops. And so they're powerful. And here's Israel facing the strength of these. And so David's cry to him, grant us help against the, the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. 
I could go hire other armies also. But it wouldn't help if you are not willing to protect us. It would be in vain for me to do so. And so he senses here his need for a confession of sin and the recognition of who God is in order to appeal for help. And so he can appeal to this God who is holy and who is sovereign. And here's what he says about that in verse 6, uh, 7, and 8. God has spoken in his holiness. First of all, he talks about his holiness. God doesn't speak in his anger apart from his holiness. When we get mad, we often speak, but it ain't holy. <laughs> it's not righteous. I have a missionary friend. Well, he's a retired missionary friend. And he said one day, I really lost my temper. And it wasn't good. <laughs> it wasn't good. And so the recognition here that God works in his holiness with exaltation. I will divide up Shechem. This is God speaking now. We're in verse 6 of Psalm 60. With exaltation, I will divide up Shechem, portion out the veil of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. All of these are on the east side of the Jordan River. Remember, they have all that area. And a part of Ephraim is on the, uh, the west side of the river also. Manasseh is you know, part of that uh, uh, tribe. And so it goes on here. Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I will cast my shoe. Over Philistia I will shout triumph. What does this mean? It means God is sovereign over all the nations. He's in control of all these people. To throw your shoe over something meant that you possessed it. Remember that in the book of Ruth? Takes his sandal off and gives it to him. There's this recognition that this is a possession. This is my authority. I have the right to do this. This is mine. And so it is. That calling upon God in his holiness and in his sovereignty. Drop down to verse 12. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. The sovereignty of God now intervening for them. We then can be valiant soldiers. Not turn tail and running. Right? But rather we can do valiant things. One of the other places in one of the other Psalms, David talks about God teaches my right hand how to bend the bow and how to wage war. He makes my feet stable and steady. And he makes my arm so strong I can bend a bow of bronze. Can you imagine that? The strength that it would take to, to hold and to pull that bow back, to bend it. And he says, this is what God does for me. And so this sense of God's holy, but he's also sovereign. And he extends his holiness. He doesn't do things for destructive reasons. There's always the expression of his holiness. The primary essence of his character is love, but it's not disconnected from his holiness. In fact, none of God's characters, characteristics are separated from each other. There's this full interweaving, full integration of himself and his personality. It's the way we're supposed to be, and one day we will be. Right? Sin's the thing that messed us all up. Someday we will be. And so we have this in Psalm uh, 60. And in 61, then, we come again to the fact that there is distress. And we need God to hear us. And so the first thing we have here is crying out to God. Hear my cry. Psalm 61, verse 1. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer from the end of the earth. I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And so this calling out to God, seeking uh, God. Because he says in verse 5, For you, O God, have heard my vows. Uh, lost my place. Hang on. Uh, you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. In another place, the psalmist says, I love the Lord God because he listens to my prayers. A listening God. Can you imagine being those 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel, calling out to your God to do something, and nothing happens all day long. You jump around, you dance, you cut yourself, you scream, you do all kinds of things, 
and the gods and the goddess are silent. And Elijah comes up, builds the, you know, the altar back up, pours water in it, all kinds of things, and says, God. Whoa. Down comes the fire. <coughs> the God who listens, the God who hears. And God who intervenes. This is a wonderful passage. I think this Psalm 61 is just absolutely amazing. God listens for our prayers. He answers our prayers. I'm not talking about us deserving to have our prayers answered. I'm talking about who God is. Right? We had a situation the other day that we prayed for, and amazing things happened. And I thought, God, this is amazing. I'm not worth this. It doesn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> I, I mean, I can imagine God saying, doesn't have anything to do with you. It has nothing to do with me. That I wanted for that other person healing and strength and blessing. And the wonderful thing that God does, and so he has here. This one who is the listening God, who can also then act. And so the psalmist will pray. I'm at uh, Roman, numeral, uh, Roman numeral 2 and capital letter D at this point. He then can appeal to this listening God to act. So in the latter part of verse 2, he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. A rock where I can get up above the turmoil and the strife and the conflict and be protected. A rock of protection. Lead me to that rock that is higher than I. And also in one sense, it lifts him up toward heaven. Don't push that too far, but it lifts him up toward heaven. And so he has this sense of this God is listening and he can do something. And so he continues on with this now. You're my refuge, my strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Look at all those kinds of things when he calls out to God uh, and names him. Right? You're a refuge. You're a rock. You're a tower. Let me dwell in your tent. Right? What did it mean to dwell in someone's tent? It meant that they were to protect you. Right? So you remember what happens right, with, uh, with Deborah and uh, who was the other woman? I can't remember her name. When the, king, when, the, when the king who had waged war against the Israelite troops was hiding, she said, come on in, the tent. You know? In other words, I will protect you and I will keep you. In her case, it was to kill him. <laughs> but the purpose was to protect. And so when the, the angels go in to Sodom and Lot takes them in, he protects them. He does everything he can to protect them because they come under my roof and therefore they are to be protected. To ask God to live in his tent is to come under his protection and to live in his protection. And so the wonderful thing about this, we can cry out to this God who listens and who is able to do something for us and all these other kinds of things, including coming under the mother chicken, <laughs> getting under those wings, snuggling up close and being protected. The wondrous kind of thing. This image is used more than once in the book of Psalms in various kinds of ways. The protection. And so they're crying out to this God who listens and calling to him to act, to do the kinds of things that only he can do. But now in confidence that in fact this God who listens not only can do these things, he will do them for his faithful people. Verse 8 at the end of this psalm. So I will ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. The commitment. I'm going to praise you, God, because I know you're listening to me and you can accomplish all your purposes for me. Whatever they may happen to be, you're capable of doing exactly what I need. And so the promises of God. So we've started here when David is a young man, a very young man, passing through at least his middle age, when he's carrying on these battles in, in chapter uh, 60. And 61 now, 
we see him, this is not, we're not specifically told, it was a part of this set of, of, of uh, experiences, but it seems to me to fit in them, right? that he needs a God who listens to him on the battlefield, who listens to him, a God who cares for him day by day, and the decisions he has to make as king, knowing that there are people who oppose him, and all the kinds of things. And so the need for singing God's praises and the end of that uh, psalm then, I will ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day by day. I want to do my part and I will do my part whether I see any immediate result to it or not. Right? Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have a hard part, a hard time doing that. If I don't see immediate results, I quit. Right? Any, anybody have that problem besides me? The, ten, the tendency to not just continue to be faithful. And yet this is what David is committing himself to do. I made a vow. I'm going to keep it. Day after day after day, I will do it. And I will wait for you to act. I will wait for you to do what you've promised to do. And in the meantime, I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing your praises. So what does it bring us to there? In Psalm uh, 62, right? this longer psalm. Uh, and uh, it's unfolding. So let's go then. We're at uh, uh, capital letter F on Roman numeral 2 on the outline. The God who is a rock and salvation and fortress. And so he says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. Now that's hard. To wait in silence. Mothers, how many times did you tell your children? Go over there and sit down until I get done here. Okay. Two seconds later. Mom! <laughs> There's something about us that this waiting in silence is just about more than we can endure. Right? Uh, and so he says, For God alone, my soul waits in silence. What do you have to have to wait in silence besides patience? I mean, there has to be a trust. There has to be a confidence that the one who has told me to do this is the one who can take care of what I'm anxious to get expressed and anxious to see happen. So it goes on. From him comes my salvation. From him alone, the word's not there, but the emphasis. From him alone comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. The confidence of who God is. These first two verses. But go down to verse 6, and we'll pick up the same theme again. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. It's repeated the other verses. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My rock, my mighty rock, and my refuge is God. So the confession the importance of giving expression to who this God is. Even if it's only reminding us, our individual selves, our collective, collectively ourselves. I remember once uh, we were in a situation as a family, when both of the kids were still home. And we were in a situation that was not happy. And it was not a good situation that we could see at that moment. But I had a sense in my spirit, if we just held steady, and I didn't know what that meant for how long. It turned out to be only a few weeks or a few months at best. I don't recall exactly now. It's been several years ago. But anyway, the point here was I told them, I said, look, God has a blessing for us here. I cannot tell you what it is. I don't know when it's coming. I know in my spirit God has a blessing for us here. So let's just sit tight. Quit grousing and griping. I was talking to myself too. right? Grousing and griping. Because God has a blessing for us here. Little could I have known what that was and how enormous it was and how fast it came. Overnight, literally, literally, overnight it happened. And we were just, you know, in fact, we're still open mouth. <laughs> how did that happen? I looked historically, by the way, to see the planning for that in God's purposes went back at least 30 years before the event. This has been 60 plus years ago. 
that already God was preparing for that event to occur. I mean, it was absolutely astounding. And sometimes we have the privilege of seeing that and seeing how long God has been at work on our behalf. Right? Other times we don't. Right? We will in heaven, of course. We'll be able to see that, that kind of thing. So the wonder of it here. The God who is my rock and my fortress and my salvation. On the other hand, not only am I helpless, as he says over in Psalm 59, we looked at that, calling in his powerlessness, but also he says human help is no good either. So look at what we have here with this. 62, Psalm 62, verses 3 and 4. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall on a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down uh, from his high position, to take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Okay? So human now, in this case, is actually malevolent, malignant. And this, is not, this wouldn't be good help at all. Right? It's here. But even if someone wanted to help, could they do so? Look at verse 9 and 10. Right? Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are our delusion. Well, maybe the little guys can't help me, but the big guy can certainly help me. Right? So I'll appeal to the Supreme Court or whatever else it may be, the governor of the state or whomever else it may be. But look at what he says about them. Those of low estate are like a breath. You take it and it's gone. Those of high estate are a delusion. Their power is really a delusion. It's God who is in control. And so their, their power, their ability to do things can sometimes melt away as quickly as possible. Right? We can't imagine that they lose their power so quickly or that it dissipates in a way that they can't do what we think they can do. So the help from human beings is also powerless in verse 10. So put no trust in extortion. I can bribe them. I can pay them off. You know, no, Don't set your hope on robbery. That won't work either. If riches increase, I don't remember when this passage, the last part of verse 10, first appeared to me. <laughs> and you know how those things jump out at you when you're reading scripture? And it jumped out at me. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Okay. Anybody ever lost a fortune? <laughs> you're like me. You never, never had a fortune to lose. <laughs> but sometimes we have lost what little we have. It's just taken away. All of a sudden, we can't imagine what, how it happens. I can remember one year that happened to me. As a Christmas gift, I was given a substantial amount of money. And the next day, I paid it to the doctor. <laughs> it's gone, just like that. Right? In and out. <laughs> that kind of thing. These kinds of things happen to us. And so, if they increase, if riches increase, so if your stock goes up, don't set your heart on it. Right? Don't spend it before it's in your hand. All those other kinds of things your parents taught you. <laughs> right? But it's also deeper than that. The riches can sometimes be money, but they can also be the power that we think is on our side, the way we can leverage things for our own well-being, other kinds of ways in which we may think about I'm in a position of control here. I've got this under my belt. Nobody needs to look anywhere else. I've got this. And I've heard people say it. I probably even said it myself a time or two. But my father taught me something in the later years of his life. He repeatedly would say from the time he was about maybe 65 or 70, he died in his early 80s, 83 I think when dad died. He would constantly say, if I live, and the Lord tarries, XXX. He would never promise me anything to do for me or to do with me or anything without saying that. If I live and the Lord tarries, then. And I thought, what a, what a thing to be taught. You know? I mean, this is what our lives are, right? They're just a breath. Just, I mean, how much have we experienced here in the village as well as elsewhere? Young, vibrant people here this moment and gone the next moment. Just, it's an amazing kind of thing, and yet here we have it. And so he says, don't put your hope 
in these kinds of things. Why? Because they can't ultimately do anything for you. So where are we then? We're coming to the end of this. Waiting for and trusting in our only hope and the only one that has power and in, our, in his steadfast love. So chapter 62, Psalm 62, uh, verse 5. For God alone, my soul, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. Not just in him, it's from him. Waiting for him to give us that fullness of hope. So do you need hope today? Wait on the Lord. Let him give that hope. You know, we sometimes run off with presumption. Remember that scene in, uh, in Pilgrim's Progress where Christian and his friend decide that the easiest way is to climb over on the other side of the fence because the path is smoother over there than the one they're on. What they don't realize is that on the other side of the fence is not God's property. It's the property of the Lord Doubt, the dread Lord of the castle. And the first thing you know, that smooth sailing turns into a dungeon of doubt and darkness and abuse. And so they try to create their own hope. And only in the, in the castle, in the store, only when they find the key, which is Scripture, and the trust in God that comes from Scripture, do they see this. And so he can say then in verse, in the verse 5 here, from God, for God alone, all my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is in him. And then he goes on, talking about being his rock and salvation. Drop down to verse 8 now. Trust in him at all times. And here's the king, talking to his people. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Pour out your heart before him. What an invitation. What an invitation from God. Pour out your heart to me. Let me know everything that's in there. He already knows it. It only scares us when we say it. <laughs> when we acknowledge that it's really there. Yeah, I really am that scared. But he says, come and pour it out to me. Trust in him. Pour your heart out to him. For God is our refuge. And then come on down to verses 11 and 12. The last two verses of this psalm. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. So the first thing, power belongs to God. The power to accomplish all things. Right? Or as Dante puts it in, in one of the uh, volumes of the Divine Comedy, it's the long poem, three volumes, but I can't remember where it is now. Anyway, he says, in heaven, the will of him who rules can and is done. Father, on earth, let your will be done as it is in heaven, fully and freely. He's able to accomplish all of his will. And so we have this. He's spoken twice I've heard it, that power belongs to God. Sometimes we are so awed and overcome by the power of things around us. We're overwhelmed by various kinds of things that we forget that power belongs to God. And any expression of power, whether it's malevolent or good, is an expression of his power, either a twisted expression of it or a full expression of it. But the power belongs to him. And so he can control even malevolent power exercise. Power belongs to God. And, verse 12, to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. To you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. Wait till we get to Psalm 136. 36 times. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Or as Peterson puts it in uh, the messy uh, Psalms, it never quits. <laughs> it never quits. Never gives up, right? And that steadfast love <coughs> never stops. So you will render to a man according to his work. Is he evil? He'll receive the evil. The work of the flesh, Paul says, will produce the fruit of the flesh. That's what will happen. But if it's goodness, then there's the fruit of goodness. And God will do this. He'll render to each one of us according to our work. 
And so as we trust him to do good in us and good through us, we reap the harvest. The harvest of the righteousness that he works in us. The harvest of praise. The harvest of eternal life. Right? Through the blood of Jesus, not something we earn, right? but we live out. And so the wonder of it all. So these Psalms, it seems to me, though they tell us about the life of David, and they're nitty gritty Psalms. I mean, there, there's nothing you know, that is warm fuzzy in most of it. This is nitty gritty stuff. And yet there it is, the faithful truth. That even in the nitty gritty of our lives, it's there. The nitty gritty of the lives of our brothers and sisters around the world. Those picking up the pieces of their houses in Nebraska or in Oklahoma or wherever else it is. Those suffering in prison in various places in the world, right? For the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, before we close here, we want just to lift them up to you. We pray the missionary prayer list. But, Father, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. So many places around the world, suffering, Father, imprisonment, suffering violence against them, being abused in all kinds of ways, cruelty and brutality of all sorts. Father, we lift them up before you now. We ask that in Jesus' name that your power, Father, will come down. Great blessing to overshadow them and empower them in ways that only you can and lift them up. We pray in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your kindness and goodness and patience. Amen. Thank you.